Well, welcome everybody uh, for for tonight's uh, book book club uh, bookmark. And uh, tonight's guest with us is is Colonel James Scott Wheeler, the author of our book on on uh, General Devers. Um, we're thrilled to have Colonel Wheeler with us. Uh, there's there's nothing better to to no better way to talk about a book and how it was put together than to than to have the author with us and and to be able to explore some of his insights. Um, Scott Disley, uh, my partner in crime here, has put together uh, a little bit of a script of questions that we're going to go through tonight uh, to try to, to tease out uh, more about the Colonel De uh, General Devers and about uh, the making of the book. And uh, as, as Caroline mentioned, if during the program and the discussion, uh, another question pops into your mind, please put it in the chat. And uh, I'll do my best to kind of try to moderate that uh, as as uh, as Scott's taking us through the questions. I will try to moderate what's in the chat and try to weave it in to the discussion the best I can so that questions do get answered. And that way, uh, uh, Colonel Wheeler doesn't have to be looking at the chat the whole time while, while he's trying to answer, answer the questions. And Scott uh, doesn't have to worry about it. I'll, I'll take care of that. So uh, with, without... Uh, Further from me, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Scott Disley and, and start with the question. Thanks, Rich. Thanks for taking care of, of the introduction of uh, Colonel Wheeler. Uh, Scott, we had a chance to talk a little bit beforehand. And in addition to having uh, been a, a, a retired, you're a retired professor of history at the United States Military Academy uh, and an author of several books, you also find time to cut firewood and uh, spend your time uh, outdoors. So, Thanks for taking some time off and spending this evening with us and, and going through some conversation for the next hour. So I'm gonna start with a simple question for you. What was your motivation for writing this book? <laughs> well, uh, starting in 1989, I took cadets to Europe for uh, what's called a staff ride. So like 11 days in the Battle of the Bulge where you went all over. The purpose of that was to train lieutenants then in 89 or 99, I was asked to go to Europe and start working for the United States Army of Europe and taking their general officers to various battles and study generalship by looking at the history and, and dicing it. And uh, I always favored us picking things like the Battle of uh, Schmidt, where the generals really do a bad job so that maybe they can dissect why those generals did a bad job. But anyway, you may have heard of Rick Atkinson. I hate him. He's run three Pulitzer Prizes. He's He's handsome. Uh, I've worked with him on a number of staff rides. He'd get up and talk and be like Robert Redford. And I'd get up and talk and be like, howdy doody. But I survived. And so we were in Alsace getting ready to do a staff ride to study the, the uh, Sixth Army Group's uh, conquest of Alsace in 1944-45. And I'd been reading everything I could get. I always start with the official histories. We call them the green books because they're in green. And they are incredibly good. Their footnotes are, are the footnotes are a gateway into the National Archives for anybody doing anything on the military in World War II. So we were in a hotel and probably there was some beer involved. And I, of course, didn't drink, you know. Uh, we were sitting there and I had read these derogatory comments in Eisenhower and Bradley's works and Patton about Devers. And I knew Devers, obviously, was the sixth Army Group commander. And I said to the group, hey, who has written anything reliable and decent about Jacob Devers? And everybody silently looked at each other. And Atkinson said, well, no one has. And of course, at this point, Atkinson's working on his trilogy of World War II. So he'd been through, he is an incredible researcher. So, but then Rick, without missing a beat, said, but you're going to write it, Scott. You just finished working on the first division book. You know, you've got all this free time. So for the next six years, thanks to Rick Atkinson, my wife and I uh, got into Jake Devers. I loved it because... Uh, my wife and I were in the army together. She wasn't active duty soldier. She was a camp follower. She would accuse herself of being incredibly valued. So we've written, which are five. She has done the research with me. We re research them together. And so we've always enjoyed it. But what was cool about Jake Devers once we started to get into it was that there was this collection of letters between his wife and he and between his sister and he that you guys have in your archive. And Tom Grease had done hundreds, if not thousands, of oral interviews, which you also have, both in hard copy and on, on uh, cassette. And 
it was really fun to read about Devers and his wife uh, and Georgie and their sometimes troublesome daughter, Frances, and it brought them to life as people. And it was something we could identify with. Um, but last but not least, have somebody run an army group and not be known intrigued me. And after Atkinson challenged me to write it, then I started doing the reading. And one reason it, uh, you mentioned it already uh, is that uh, Rich said he didn't write a book and he did not. He didn't know, he didn't write a show and tell book. And of course, Ike did, a brilliant writer. Ike was crusade in Europe and, and, uh, and his facts are pretty good. Bradley's is dreadful. Um, there's two versions of Bradley's story and they've changed the story as they go, but that's about all we had. And then Patton in his diaries uh, has a few words to say and more telling in his letters to his wife, uh, George Patton. So it hooked me. And the last but not least in 77, when I got to West Point, Tom Grease was writing the definitive history. In fact, he was doing it in partnership with uh, you folks with the Yorktown Historical Society. And so I'm pretty sure they even gave him some financial support and they transcribed the things for him and a lot of effort had got into it. And by 77, the Academy had a huge cheating scandal and Tom was heavily involved in cleaning that mess up and he never got to write the book. So years later, after Atkinson uh, suggested this, and that was about 2009 or seven or 10, whenever, around 2009, I got a hold of the history department and asked, well, is there a draft of Grease's book. Maybe I could edit it and it would be Tom Grease writing about Jacob Devers edited by Scott Wheeler, which would have been just fine. And sadly, there wasn't. So that launched the mission. I don't know if that explains it, but that's how I got hooked in there. It, it does explain it, but, but I think it begs a question, uh, another question then. One of the things I noticed throughout the biography or through, throughout your work was that you really strive to uncover the motives behind Devers' actions. And, and I think part of that was, as you mentioned, looking at his letters to Georgie and looking at some of those correspondence. Can you talk a little bit more about some of those deeper dives that you took into whether it was diaries, letters, other correspondence to try to get behind the motives behind yeah, Devers' really actions? Hard to get. It's hard to do motives unless they write my motive is or words to that effect. So you have to be real careful. You don't put words into their mouth or thoughts into their brain that weren't really there. Uh, and it's a little bit like um, Sherlock Holmes. When the dog doesn't bark, it tells you something too. And so I guess having served for 30 years, having been a lot of places, Devers was having had a relationship with my wife that I think was as close as he and Georgie were. That may have been why I would come to those things, but I was always try to, I always try to be careful in the narrative to not say this is definitively what he thought, but this may have been on his mind or this could have been a factor. And I hope I haven't um, put words into his mouth. That's unfair to the dead. I, I don't, I don't believe you did, but, but you do end the book with, with a, a sentence, Jacob Laux Devers is a man who should never be forgotten by a grateful nation. So I think that gives us your bias about General Devers. Uh, but in the same breath, as, as I reflect on that sentence, what is it that you hope your reader takes away from the experience? Wow. Um, well, number one, I hope they enjoy it. Um, that reading about someone from York should be important to you all because you live there or from Pennsylvania. Uh, reading about someone who... Uh, was in the army when it went from horses to helicopters, uh, from rifles to machine guns. The whole period he lived in was a, an incredible transformation in our nation. Um, if you go to West Point, he built West Point, basically. If you go to Fort Bragg, he built Fort Bragg. Um, he was in a highly politicized service, especially once he became a general. And yet it didn't seem to go to his head. You know, the one remark that uh, Marshall made allegedly in 1957 was that he was ambitious. We all came on. I haven't met a general or a colonel in the army who wasn't ambitious. It's too much work if you're just, yeah, you want to serve and you want to do your, you know, live up to your oath to the Constitution and to this great country that we serve. But um, so that if that's the worst thing you can say about Jacob Devers, yeah, 
Uh, I also was intrigued that he had had so many high level jobs and no one, but no one said anything. He had the same jobs Eisenhower had. I commanded the European theater operations. Devers commanded it. Devers was there when, when the eighth air force was getting its clock cleaned by the Luftwaffe where 10 to 15% of every mission was shot down. So if you have hundred planes go out, 15 are shot down. That's 150 airmen lost. 70% of the planes are being shot up. The targets weren't getting hit. And they wanted to fire Acre. Acre was the head of the Air Force, the 8th Air Force. And, and uh, Hap Arnold wrote to Devers saying, I'll send you a man who can really get stuff done. And Jake instead, and he could have said, oh, sure, send me in your hottest, sharpest guy. Um, but Jake stood by his subordinate and says, no, you're the problem, General. You haven't given him enough air crews, haven't given him repair parts, haven't given him facilities. You need two crews for every bomber. You need spare bombers and their exchange. And so Arnold sent a general over to check on him, see if Devers was telling the truth. And yeah, he was telling him the truth. And he he helped make the 8th Air Force an effective fighting force before he left in December of 43. But he didn't get the credit for that. And Eisenhower totally different personality, the greatest coalition leader in, in American history, I think, and maybe Western history, Marlboro comes close. Um, Eisenhower did a terrific job, but there were things I didn't understand at all. I could never have built Fort Bragg. Uh, I could deal with the British, which is not always easy. I could deal with Montgomery, which is a pain in the ass, but uh, Devers could build West Point. If you go to West Point, he built the North Athletic Fields. He built the field house. He did incredible things there. He was the first uh, executive officer of West Point in history as a colonel. He uh, made West Point obey the NCAA rules on eligibility. That's no, no mean feat because I'm not a West Point graduate, but they do take their football real seriously. Uh, I'm a Montana and we take ours serious too. But. So how can this guy who's done those, he built the armor force, he picked most of the armor generals, he worked for Leslie McNair, who was the Army Ground Forces commander, and had the audacity, courage, and correctness to tell McNair he didn't agree with him on a couple of key points. Explain why. McNair said, here's what we're going to do. And then Devers said, yes, sir. And they did it. Um, I didn't do that. Also, I'm, I have a predilection. Uh, I like generals or senior military leaders who don't cheat on their wife. And who don't, in public, stab their peers in the back. And I couldn't find anything to indicate that Deffers ever cheated on his wife or was disloyal to a peer or to a subordinate. If you go look at the history of it, Bradley relieved, Bradley and Hodges relieved more corps and division commanders than probably any American generals in the modern era. I can't think of one time Devers relieved a general. He had three that were two were just absolutely worn out by combat. Uh, and asked to be relieved. And he had one who was thrown out of his Jeep when it hit a landmine, division commanders. So that kind of guy appeals to me. That's the kind of person I, I'd like to work for. And so it made it even more fun. But you're right, there is, I really had to fight becoming heavily biased in his favor and try to see the other side. Like when we did the decision not to cross the Rhine, I chose not to. And uh, there's a very good book saying that that was a bad mistake by Ike and so forth. Uh, Devers wanted to jump the Rhine, but the evidence clearly shows that Eisenhower was right. A, they didn't have the force. Once you're across the Rhine, the Germans are massing troops. We knew that. We thought it was for something else. It's going to be for the Battle of the Bulge. If we had crossed the Rhine in November of 1944, we'd have gotten across, but only with like one or two divisions, and we would have been slaughtered by the Germans because we wouldn't have had air power because it's November. Uh, we didn't have any reserves to put in there. And last but not least, the 7th Army was almost out of ammunition. And Ike was loyal to his plan. Ike had a broad front strategy. He had explained that to everybody, to include Devers, and he stuck with it. And I think Devers did the right thing, saying, here's an alternative. And then when the boss said, no, we're not going to do that, and they had a very heated argument that night. Right, but anyway. And Ike left with his head totally red. When he got mad, he was bald and his head would turn red. And Devers came down a little later and went to bed. Uh, and that was it. 
There was no more discussion about it. I said later, he was sorry that it didn't work out, that you don't have a, a patent-esque kind of immaturity where you throw a tantrum. So another reason it was hard not to really like this guy Devers. I looked at his history in, in um, York too a lot. I'm impressed with his family. He, he had truly an idyllic upbringing. But the York schools, uh, I went to the school records there in York. What struck me is, yes, the uh, elementary school was segregated, probably because of the neighborhoods people lived in. So the uh, black children in, in, had their own school. But when he went to high school, uh, there were 117 African-Americans in his uh, high school. And I think it really was one of the best things that ever happened to him. He, like I, went to an integrated high school. I went to high school in the 60s. And my school was in Spokane, Washington, well integrated with Asian Americans. And, and so when I went into the service, I wasn't shocked, you know, from an all white environment. They ever said that. And you look at, and you've got several questions we can deal with when we get to them. But it just, you look at the guy and you start to say, and I'm trying to, I was actually looking for some things that were wrong. And really, and I hope you can find them and be a great article for you to write for Army Magazine, and I'll write an intro to Army Magazine for you. Uh, but he's squeaky clean. He'd never make it in politics. That's a joke. <laughs> Rich, I, I saw there was a question in the chat. I don't know if you want to try to integrate that in at this point or, or not. Okay, sorry, I didn't miss that one. Oh, no, that's okay. So we're, uh, I can grab that for us. Is this so, the one about ego? Yes, please. Yeah, you know, I think I think we've we've discussed a little bit. But the question is why was why was Devers different from so many of the World War II generals with respect to ego and, and self promotion? Uh, is the question. Well, I don't know for sure. He clearly was different, but if you look at his upbringing and his father and his grandfather's role in his upbringing and his mother's role, I think any ego. He had shown as a young an adolescent or an adult, got knocked off his shoulder by his parents in his school. You know, he was a prankster, no question about it. And he was the leader of the gang. You've seen Sparky in our gang or whatever like that. He was the leader. But uh, I don't think uh, he was allowed to have a lot of ego. And I think it makes a difference. But I also think his parents were good about loving all their children equally. And I, I think. If you have more than one child, that's an incredibly important thing to do and not always easy. But, so I think it goes right back to his upbringing and probably in the high school in New York. You notice in the book that he stays in connection with his friends throughout his life. You know, not everybody in his class, but a significant number of friends and, and his brothers. And I think that uh, friends sometimes reign in your ego, too. At least I've had that experience. Mm hmm. Scott, you talked about the, the relationship with, with Eisenhower. Uh, can you talk a little bit more how that relationship developed over time? Uh, and especially after being appointed Supreme Com Allied Commander, uh, do you believe that Eisenhower's continued disdain for Devers maybe just was intellectual snobbery at that point? I think it was insecurity. Mm. Um, and I, again, this is one of those places where I speculate in the book. I was sent in 42 to England to find out why Cheney wasn't getting things done. General Cheney was the commander of the European theater operation. <clears throat> and uh, Marshall sent Ike over there from the war plans and said, take a look around there and tell me how things are doing. Come back and report. Ike came back and reported and he said, things are goofed up. And uh, they need a pack. somebody who can really get it organized, energized, and get it moving. And, and Marshall said, uh, Ike, who do you suggest? And Ike said, General McInerney, who was a very fine officer. It would have been a good choice, too. And Marshall said, well, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll tell you what we're going to do. And the next morning, Marshall tells Ike, pack your bags. You're going to England. So when Devers was told by Marshall in December of 42, to go to North Africa and figure out why our armor was getting its clock cleaned by the Germans in battle, why our anti-tank guns aren't killing the German tanks, why our units aren't performing like they should out of the armor force. So he was ordered by 
uh, the chief of staff to go to Africa, start with the British, Cairo, work your way back to Algeria and take a look at what, what's happening, armor. How are the British fighting the Germans? How are we fighting the Germans? So they did. It was a 29 day, 29,000 mile trip. Um, they, they wrote a full report, which is in the archives. And uh, it was a good group. It was Ted Brooks was on it and Willister Palmer was on it. Two very fine officers who have a lot of uh, collaboration for it. And they found uh, the way the British were doing things was a lot smarter than the way we were doing. And we were, attack we were attacking uh, cavalry style, all uh, John Wayne sabers rattling with tanks out in the open against an enemy who knew how to dig in, hide their guns. And, and there's a saying, anything that can be seen on a battlefield can be hit and anything that can be hit can be killed. That's from my time as a tanker. And that's exactly what it was happening to us. So he came back uh, to Iran and he spent two nights with Eisenhower. Well, first of all, Eisenhower knows Devers, who is senior to him in the army is a perfect choice to take command if they decide to remove Ike. So Ike, in the back of his mind, had his own experience in England when he was sent to investigate by George Marshall. Same guy. Is this the same thing? It wasn't, by the way. I think it was an innocent thing that, that Marshall wanted to sort out. So second, Ike was chain smoking 40 cigarettes a day. He had pneumonia. He had high blood pressure. Uh, he is being harped on by Winston Churchill, which was never easy. Uh, this was a bad time to have Jake Devers show up. Jake is naively optimistic, which is one of my flaws. Uh, and sometimes it gets you in trouble. And he was telling Ike, my God, they're not using the second armor correctly. Now, they being who? Ike's command. And so forth and so on, so on or first armor, armor, I'm sorry. So for two nights, you have this guy who's never been in combat telling this general who actually hasn't been in combat either. He's 600 miles from the front lines, but he's got the responsibility. This young whippersnapper is telling him all these things that could and should be fixed. And it really rubbed Ike wrong. Ike was insecure anyway. If you look at their backgrounds, their upbringing, Look at Ike's upbringing in Kansas and in Texas, living in a chicken coop, uh, kind of a weird family, in my opinion. Uh, not a bad family, but weird. He is an insecure person. And he doesn't like to be with people he doesn't know. He doesn't take criticism well. Uh, Carlo Deste's biography of, of Eisenhower, I think it, it does a great deal to correct some of our impressions of Eisenhower without taking away the fact he did win the war. He did keep the coalition together. He was the right guy. And Devers knew that. So anyway, Devers goes back, writes the report. Um, Ike finally goes to bed for four days because he's so sick. And we've all been sick. And we don't do well when someone co comes in and tells us we're really not running the, uh, the company correctly or the household accounts correctly or whatever correctly. Um, so that started it, in my opinion. Then Devers was chosen to take over the European theater when Ike was permanently left in the Mediterranean to run the war because he's become the supreme commander. So Devers is there. And in the summer of 43, during the Sicily operation, Ike wants Devers to give him five wings of bombers. Now, Devers right then, in the middle of 43, is doing what with the 8th Air Force? Trying to build it up trying to, to do what the combined chiefs of staff have ordered him to do, which is to absolutely bomb the bejeepers, that's a great word, out of the Germans. And so Devers says no. And Ike appeals to the combined chiefs of staff. They say no, because Ike is, uh, Devers is following the plan. And they, if they moved those bombers from England, they would have moved them to North Africa, but there wouldn't have been the logistics base to take care of five wings, which is about 120 bombers. So he then appealed to Marshall. Marshall told him, no, Devers is right. So that irritated him. That's what most people say was their first falling out. But I think it goes back to January when uh, he was criticizing the way the war was being fought in North Africa. 
stupidly not realizing he was criticizing the guy in charge. And I fault Devers uh, about Ike at that time. Then it goes on, it gets worse. They try a second time on the bomber business. And so by this time, by mid 43, Ike has no use for Jacob Devers. Uh, Marshall in December goes on a worldwide tour of the Far East. While he's gone, Ike moves to London and without asking, telling or whatever, anybody, he reassigns Devers to the Mediterranean. So that's, so disdain is at least the right word. Someone I noticed in chat said maybe hatred, uh, but I think it really comes back to we're, we're all human. And if you're insecure and somebody like that comes along and the, the moon and the stars didn't align right and it just got worse. Um, what saved Devers in the eyes of Ike was that Devers did a very good job in the Mediterranean, unsnarled some of the things that couldn't be unsnarled before by anyone else, got along with the British, more important, got along with the French. Because in 44, uh, uh, we're arming the French army, 10 divisions, and uh, big controversy, should we arm the French or not? They're losers, blah, blah, blah. And Marshall correctly says, no, that'll be 10 divisions of soldiers that will be fighting and dying for us. So that's 10 divisions of Americans that don't have to do the fighting and dying. So anyway, and the rest is history, as they say. But I think that's the, the origins of it. Um, also, Ike's blind side is his loyalty to his friends. When he makes a friend, he's loyal forever. And so great example is Omar Bradley, his classmate, uh, to his spots, another classmate. Also, um, uh, Leonard Giroux, who was a fifth corps commander. Ike said, I'll have no corps commanders who haven't had combat experience in this war. But he takes Leonard Giroux, who's had no combat experience in this war. And because Giroux is the guy that introduced Mamie to Ike. So Ike has flaws too. One of them is sort of this blind loyalty on one hand. And I think maybe the little slow to realize on the other, there may be somebody outside his orbit that would be just the right guy. So sorry for the long answer. I told you I talked too damn much. Uh, fascinating. Uh, thank you. No, I appreciate that. Uh I want to shift us just a little bit. You had mentioned the race relations, and I just want to read a few lines out of, of your book. Uh, on page 174, you stated that national policy was that blacks would be drafted in a proportion that matched their representation in the total population, about 9%. Although the army remained segregated, as in the First World War, uh, change was clearly coming. The U.S. Army would be at the center of this change in racial relations over the next six years. Can you talk about the role Devers played in race relations and improving that during his time? I don't think he made a major contribution, uh, but it was clearly indicative of the way he dealt with some problems at Fort Knox and then problems when we were fielding um, African-American tank battalions that he was never on the side of those who'd say, hell no. Um, integration of African-Americans occurred during my career. We really don't sort it out till the 70s. The resistance came from the generals in the 40s and 50s. We didn't want African-American soldiers, didn't feel they could be fielded as combat troops. Uh, and they were totally wrong. Um, it took a few her heroes like Huebner, Clarence Huebner, to really move the ball forward. In 48, they're integrated legally by the president, which was a very good decision. But it takes another 20 years to get to the point where we can even work it right. But the army was at the center of one of the most important things our nation's ever done. If we had stayed segregated, our nation would be in even worse conditions today than it is now. Or you, you know what I'm saying. And the army is a social institution, which it is. I was when, at West Point when we integrated women. Who stood in the door against that idea? The old grads and the general officers. When we integrated uh, gays, whatever you may think about it, it's been very successful and has not torn the force apart. The resistance came from the generals. I was sitting in a room in Verdun with a bunch of generals, and I was a fly on the wall sitting in the corner. I'd been leading them on the staff right during the day, but I'm just a technical guy. And uh, the general said, one thing before we break up tonight was the third seminar in three nights. We had this group all day on the battlefield and then seminars 
before dinner where they did some thinking. He said, it's coming, it's coming soon. The military is gonna accept gays. You have two choices, make it work or get out. And that's always been my attitude on, on those personal views are, my oath was to the constitution. And that's a very clear chain of authority. And so I'm very proud of the army for having led that way, whether you agree or don't agree with any of the things that I've spoken of, uh, the army has done what it's supposed to do, which is uh, make the best, follow the orders. So Devers wasn't a key player in it, but he showed again, I think it was, goes back to his upbringing in York, that his family was not one of those families that was heavily overtly prejudiced. All humans have prejudice, I think that's fair to say. And the fact that his school was integrated um, is amazing. The fact that when he was at Knox, he found innovative ways to deal with something that could have been an explosive issue, when, especially when offered help um, by a, an African-American woman who had courage to come. And he couldn't get her to come in the front door, he says in his interviews, uh, but he sure as hell listened to her and did what you had to do. So. I guess in a, you know, a sense, if we all do our little part, then it seems to work much better than if we have one or two heroes. Can, can you elaborate a little bit more on that relationship with, with Margaret Collier and, and how she influenced his thinking? Not a lot of evidence. It's difficult to do. Uh, they didn't have a written exchange with each other. We do know that uh, Devers, we have to take Devers' word for this, that she came and saw him several times, came with a solution to the hotel issues for the young lieutenant, black lieutenants are coming in, um, that sort of thing for the armor force. But we really don't know much more about that. Um, I, at least I haven't found it. And that would be a fascinating thing to uh, research and figure out, but I don't have a good answer. I'll jump back to to his time at Fort Knox. There's a story there of the naming of the parade grounds mm. uh, after Robert Brooks, uh, the first African American to to be uh, killed in the Philippines. Uh, was that a was that a bold statement on Devers' part doing something like that? No, I just think he did it and moved on. I mean, he didn't make a big deal of it. That's. I mean, that is maybe the best clue that that was a core value for him. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, he didn't make a deal of it. He didn't uh, beat his chest about it that I know of. Um, at least I haven't seen anything. You know, I've, I've obviously missed some things. but I like what you said there, one of his core values. It was it was the right thing to do at the time, and he did it. Yeah. I think that's a good question. Right, I'll, I'll pause there. I see you, you're picking up some questions. Yeah, we do have a question going back to the uh... – uh, decision not to cross the Rhine, the, the refusal of, of Devers cross the Rhine. And, and uh, we have a question from Adam. Um, I guess some people believe that if a different leader had gone to, to Ike with that uh, plan, somebody like Patton perhaps, that, uh, that Ike might have allowed himself to be persuaded by a different leader uh, other than Devers. Um, what, are you, what are your thoughts on that? That's always possible. Obviously, if the first army had jumped the Rhine or could have jumped the Rhine, he would have said go because they were the main effort. But all along in his strategy, the seventh army and the first French army were a sideshow there to protect the right flank of the 12th, of Bradley's 12th army group. And they were never to be the spearhead to drive into Germany. So Ike's concept was solid. Um, I think maybe it wouldn't have been quite such a uh, head-to-head verbal battle that night in the hotel, upstairs in the hotel where everybody heard them yelling at each other, if it had been Bradley. But uh, I was very careful on his concept. He didn't let Bradley change the rules either. In fact, Bradley, by the end of December, has almost alienated his friend Eisenhower by saying, I won't serve. If you put me under Montgomery, I won't serve. And that's the least professional thing a, a soldier can say while well, your soldiers are on the front lines dying in the tens of thousands. You're not going to serve? Holy criminy. And it really irritated Ike. Um, and Devers never did something that stupid. But yeah, it maybe it would have made a difference. Uh, it wouldn't have been Patton. Uh, Ike uh, was very uncomfortable with George Patton. I think the evidence there is overwhelming. I 
who commanded a unit maybe six months in his life, was uncomfortable with people like Terry Allen, George Patton, and probably Jake Devers, because Jake Devers had a lot of soldier time between 1909 and 1939. He commanded significant numbers of months uh, in units, which was very unusual. And he had a four-year command of a, a large organization at West Point. He had a command of an artillery battery, a battalion. He had command of a battery. He had extensive field experience. He, like Leslie McNair, knew that the most important thing you do in the Army is make sure there's dinner for your soldiers at the end of the day, uh, little things like that. And that was the difference between he and Ike. It, again, it's not a flaw in Ike because I don't think Devers could have done the coalition thing. Um, he had to give it his best shot. Yeah, so I don't think, I don't think that's what soured it, but it clearly soured several of the things that happened, like Northwind or Nordwind, as the Germans call it which is worth discussing too, because that to me is Ike's, Ike was within inches of making a really bad decision for the future. You know, I, I was going to interject a question about that one because um, when Devers was, and his, and his folks were, were trying to plan these, these defenses in depth and various places they could fall back to, and, and Eisenhower was saying, no, you're going to fall back immediately to where I want you to. Um, at one point, you you, you said that that uh, they, they'd had a meeting, but perhaps Devers didn't really understand what Ike wanted, and uh, and that may have led to some confusion. And I, yeah, I was going to ask you about that, and just you know, how would these two leaders at that level, and if something of that importance, have a meeting and not both leave understanding the the same thing? That's a great question. If you, I think you'd have to get the answer lies in Ike. If you look at his meetings with Montgomery, they would have a meeting and they'd each come away with a different concept because Ike at those meetings never said, now, damn it, Montgomery, this is the way we're going to do it. He always tried to equivocate so that he, he didn't back off his position, but he left enough vagueness that Montgomery came away from the meeting with a different concept. And we know this because when you look at their papers and their letters to each other, which we have, I mean, the ICT letters are published and, and uh, Montgomery stuff is published, that Montgomery at, after the meeting says, this is what we agreed. And Ike then has to write a letter back to Montgomery, which he can do and say, no, this is what we're going to do. So I, in a face-to-face -face discussion, I believe part of his good quality for keeping a coalition together, but bad quality for tactical strategic operations doesn't say face to face, damn it, Scott, this is what we're going to do. I've heard you. Now go out and prosper. And, and I, I think that's the origins of it. Um, but it was an incredibly bad decision. By Ike, he had been Kazarined twice, once at Kazarine and once in the Bulge. And he didn't want that to happen again. And I understand that. But if we had given up Northern Alsace and Strasbourg, like Eisenhower was ordering Jake to do and came close to relieving him from command, if we had given that up, there would have been no NATO. France would have never forgiven us because the Gestapo would have moved right back in and murdered by the train car load, the people who had even been happy we were there. So... There's also another problem. There was a concentration camp in that area, and there was also one of the German nuclear facilities, uh, which would have been ungood to let them have back. I don't know if what a difference made, but uh, Devers lost that argument. He was ordered to pull out, and even then he was walking the fine line by saying, yeah, I'll get it done, boss. I'll have it done by the 5th of January, where in Ike's eyes, he wants everybody back in like about 20 minutes. Uh, again, the, the complexity of moving 400,000 soldiers into a retrograde operation under pressure by one of the best armies in history uh, is not simple. Just moving the ammo. You know, when Third Army turned north into the bulge, for one corps, it took 15,000 truck sorties to move one army corps, its fuel, its ammunition, its hospitals. 60% um, of the armies are those things, not, not the bullet 
squeezers or trigger squeezers. So anyway, um, Devers did everything he could. He flew and talked to his boss. He sent his chief of staff and said, I want to stay there. If you have to sleep with, with uh, Beetle Smith, do it. But damn it, get that order changed. Uh, and Patch, Alexander Patch to me is, would be a fun person to write a history of. I don't know if there's enough materials to do it. But he and Simpson are the two unsung heroes, war army commanders of the year. Very good. Both, I think, got shafted in the end by Ike. But uh, uh, we were in we were West Point. I'm going to do an aside here because uh, Patch means so much to me. We were in the archives at West Point. We were reading the Patch papers. They're not extensive, but there were these letters, series of letters between Patch and his wife and his daughter. And his son was a lieutenant in the army, or a major, or captain, I'm sorry, captain, and had been wounded in Normandy. And then had, and this is in the book, um, but I looked up and my wife is bawling because she is reading those letters. And she's just read the letter of him saying how proud he was of his son and how great it was to have him there. And then he says, and I watched them advance. And then that night he writes the second letter. And so the editors or the publishers said, well, you got to take those four or five pages out. And I said, yeah, they need to be in there. Um, so many generals lost sons. The chief of staff lost his favorite stepson, was killed. Uh, Hatch. Um, just you go down the list. It's just amazing how many generals' sons died in, in the Second World War. Well, Scott, in the chat, you've already sold one copy of an Alexander Patch book, so you know, you've got a buyer. I'll, 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 I'll buy this. I'll buy the second one. I, I want to take you back there. We've talked a lot about Eisenhower. Were there ways that Marshall could have better utilized Jake uh, and helped him become more of a, a known figure in history? You know, we, we, I think we've established that he's been, been under. Uh, celebrated for his contributions, but uh, you know, if we could play a what if game, could Marshall have used him differently? Oh, it, it, good question. I mean, Devers had plum jobs. I mean, to be a theater commander is pretty damn impressive, and to be the deputy theater commander under uh, Maitland uh, Wilson is impressive. To all the things he did were great jobs. Build the armor force, be the first man in his class to make general. But look at Marshall. Marshall insisted that he was not going to write a memoir. And George Marshall did not write a memoir. He wrote a memoir from World War I and then put it away. And it was found, fortunately. And it's a fabulous account of his time in World War I when he was the right-hand man of, of John J. Pershing. And we find out tons about Pershing that we'd never known. But Marshall just wasn't the type that thought that officers should uh, write their own book, uh, their kiss and tell book. In many ways, they're both that way. And also Devers was very insecure about writing, got to be honest. And he didn't feel he was a, a good stylist and he, and he probably wasn't, but his letters are clear. Um, you, you're, you're sitting on a gold mine there. I hope you'll follow up and all you'll go in there and pick a little aspect of his life and, get into his letters and put it into the army magazine or your local history magazine. Uh, Cause I just envy you all being there. I could spend days and days and days in there. So hang on. I got to let my Labrador in. She's going crazy. Sorry. Oh, fantastic. I want to, I want to jump over to the concentration camps. Uh, General Devers, uh, when he approached Dachau, uh, he commented that that it was essential that these atrocities uh, be documented, and and he he even said that uh, you know he wants to make sure that that the German people can never say that they were not Nazis and that they didn't know what was going on. And and his letters to Georgie are are very graphic in in what he experienced there. What did Devers know of these camps before visiting, and how did that visit then affect his outlook after that? Do we have any evidence on that? Well, the first camp liberated was in Alsace. Right. I've forgotten the name of it. But I'm sure he visited. Uh, it was nothing like Dachau, which was horrible. So 
and, and he never written the letters are incredible because that's the most anger I see in any of his letters. His letters about the Germans back to uh, Georgie really show a man that is really upset with the, with the things they have done. Um, it's a bit like Sherman. Um, so uh, he did his part, you know, he was on the American Battlefield Monument Commission later in life after George Marshall retired from it. And I think he did his best to make sure the story got told whenever he could. Um, but also everybody wanted to forget that too. And he did a wonderful welcome. And, and I've, I've had the pleasure once of staying in the Devers suite in the Yorktown hotel. That was great fun. And it looks like when Devers left, he said, don't change a thing till I get back and they haven't, but it's, it's a, it's a nice place. I like it a lot. I, well, I really like York, but, uh, so I'm sure that no one imagined how bad it was, even though we knew it was bad. Um, and I'm sure that we don't know how bad the atrocities the Russians are doing really are. And I'm sure the Ukrainians are doing that. We, we've got to remember that the 45th Infantry Division, when they liberated Dachau, lined up a bunch of the camp guards and machine gunned them. I'm not sure that's any worse than the fact that the inmates were ripping them apart physically too so and they were court martials and the men were convicted several of them but then it was sort of basically commuted and uh, that was the end of it it'd be hard to be a soldier in the 45th division which fights from sicily all the way to germany um, and they have seen what the enemy can do it'd be hard not to be hardened and want to take justice in your own hands even though it's wrong I think that's one of the hardest things for those soldiers. I don't want to leave us on that heavy topic. I, I have to, and I might may spoil the end for some of you if you haven't finished the book, but I, I loved your telling of his second marriage mm. and, and uh, you know, asking permission to court. And so can you talk a little bit about that phase of his life? Yeah. I mean, um, I got to get the names all straight. Dorothy was his secretary when he became Army Ground Forces Commander in 1945. And she was very loyal. She had a daughter named Bonnie. Bonnie Bean was her name then, B-E-N-N. -N. And Bonnie's name is now Bonnie Bean Hamstreet and lives in Florida. But uh, they, they were colleagues and very chaste, nothing crazy about it that I can detect. I mean, I'd, I'd love to be able to have some you know, kiss and tell thing in the book. Um, and he treated her really well. She was on her way to Japan. She was going to get a new job. She was all packed up. And then Georgie and Jake realized they didn't want to lose her. So then he said, I'll give you the job. I'm going to go over to the AAA and Automobile Association. And I need a secretary. Well, I've shipped my goods to Japan. Well, we'll get them back. And until then, you can live with us. And then uh, when his wife died, he waited that full year. Very old fashioned, probably like a York citizen should be in that era. And uh, asked if he could court, which was the next stage. Um, and the, Bonnie Hamstreet is one of the most delightful people I've ever met because she gave me what she could from her perspective. She meant that there was in 45 and she also knew Francis. We, my wife and I suspect that they cleaned the letters out between themselves about their daughter. You see it in a few letters, comments about Francis. Uh, as a parent, I have occasionally been frustrated with my children, or one of them anyway, and uh, at a time. So you can see that. So, But uh, Dorothy uh, was really there for Jake the last four or five years, and it's kind of a romantic story. It, he was it, about, it, it surprised me. Yes, I, I enjoyed that part of it. Did I he, was like, he was like 90 at that time, right? When they got married. Yeah. Wasn't he close to 90 years old? Yeah, he was close to 90. I think he was about 88. He died when he was 92, if I remember right. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was old fashioned, but he was pretty spry. I mean, still be golfing when you're 90. I hope I'm still driving my tractor when I'm 80. So, <laughs> uh, 
You got to admire it. <laughs> he didn't. He wasn't a heavy drinker. And he wasn't a heavy smoker either. I think that may have contributed to his longevity. Scott and Scott, <laughs> please. Can I add something? <laughs> please, um, please. Yep. Um, I actually had dinner with Jacob Devers and his wife Dorothy. <laughs> so he was. I'm figuring he was 87 at the time. One second, Fry. There's an echo. And um, my brother, Matt Brown, we're from York. And unfortunately, Matt's been trying to get on here tonight and he can't get on. But Matt was at West Point uh, from 75 to 79, played on the basketball team. But any before Matt went to, to uh, West Point, that a young boy from York, he was at York Catholic, uh, was going to be going up to West Point to play basketball. And he heard that his sister was down at Georgetown in college. It was the freshman there. So he invited me. I got an invitation to have dinner with General Devers and his wife uh, at their home in Georgetown. Wow. And I don't, you know, I was probably this bubbling freshman. <laughs> I don't remember much of it. But what I do remember is they had a long dining room table and they each sat at one end. <laughs> and there I was in the middle of this long <laughs> table. That's that's a, that was what I remember most. But uh, I'm jealous. Was, yeah, it was really something. And so a few weeks ago, my husband and my other son lives in D.C., and uh, we walked past his home in Georgetown just to see where it was. So that was interesting. Yeah. 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 But Matt, my brother, Matt, is in, I read the book, and it was such a good book, a wonderful book. Oh, uh, but yes. when I'm looking in the back, I always like to look for uh, in the bibliographies to see if there's other books I might be interested in. And then when I got to the bibliography, I started looking down and Stephen Ambrose and Walt Winston Churchill and all these famous names. And my I see Matthew Brown is there because my brother, uh, who well, I wish he had been able to get on tonight, he um, he actually did a uh, his at the War College in Carlisle. He did a his project in 2001 on Jacob Devers, a okay. strategic assessment of Jacob Devers, Matthew yeah. Brown. So thank you for listing, listing that. <laughs> it was a very good work. Huh? Oh, good. He'd be happy to good. hear that. Oh, <laughs> so, cool. That's a neat story. Yeah. but And he, he served in the military for 29 years and retired as a colonel. And he's a retired That's colonel up in Carlisle now, enjoying well, thank you for me. college. I look for him. I get up there. Um, yeah. But you the other thing he's talking about race relations is at the end of his life, Jake took mm -hmm. under his wings an African-American family in 1950. Yeah. Virtually adopted the two kids, put them through college. Mm -hmm. That maybe gets back to the other question. It just popped into my disorganized brain. So I'm sorry to bring that in. Yeah. I'm, I'm just thrilled that someone wants to read the book and talk about it. It was uh, yeah. great fun to go back and revisit uh, General Devers. And, yeah. and, so I have one you. question. Is it going to be a movie or a documentary? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't think it is. I hope it does does add to the our understanding of senior leadership in World War II and to also what it's like to be in the Army for 30 years with your spouse, 40 years in, in Jake's case, 30 in ours. Uh, also, the personal nature of those things that, uh, like when Alexander Patch's son was killed, Devers sort of shield him for four days, uh, that kind of thing, which is incredibly important. Um, so that's what I hope people take away and, and the, the, the humanity of the guy, because he's certainly not uh, sexy. <laughs> it's just, you can't say nasty things about him. Um, and when you look at the relationship with he and Ike in the fifties, maybe they kind of buried the hatchet too, because Jake was a fervent supporter of Dwight David Eisenhower's campaigns. Scott, I hope you have a chance to take a look at the chat. Then there are some very nice comments from, from our listeners. Uh, so, some uh, thanks uh, to you there. Uh, let's just wrap up. Uh, so what's next? What, uh, what can we expect from you uh, in the future? Well, my first three books were on 17th century British Irish history. And so we're going back to that. Uh, written a chapter in a book that's just come out about a leader in Ireland in the 1640s 
who was very important, and he also is forgotten. Part of it is because he was the head of a Catholic family and he was a Protestant in a country torn by incredible sectarian stuff to this day. So we're, we're going to dabble in that. And the fun part of it is Jane and I will do the research together. We're going to Oxford in, in October for a week to kind of kickstart that. And so we're going back to that. Well, I, it takes me five or six years to write a book by the time I research it and so forth. So maybe, you know, I mean, I get there, but I'll have fun on the journey. Rick Atkinson, by the way, who wins all these Pulitzer Prizes and who's a really dear friend, it takes him six years to write a book. I mean, they're so well researched. If you have not read The British Are Coming, I highly recommend it, especially given York's place in the American Revolution. And one of my wife's ancestors was a Yorkite, Ziegler. We're proud of York. Thank you very much. We're going to put it on the calendar. I'll call you in, in about five years. We'll get you back on the uh, rotation. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, I'll, I'll come out and see the dedication of your new building. You are absolutely That'd be great. To do that. That'd that. be wonderful. That would be great. Thank you all. Thank you Thank all. Thank you very for much. your time tonight, uh, Scott. We appreciate you taking an hour with us, and uh, we did enjoy the book immensely. Uh, so, thank you. Take care. We'll see you hopefully soon. Yes, sir. Thank you, Good Scott. Night, all. all right. Good night, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. <laughs> And uh, don't forget to possibly join us in November on November 28th for our last bookmark of 2022, which will be the Murder and Mayhem in York County by Joseph David Kress. Thank you, Scott, for showcasing that book there. <laughs>